Welcome everyone to our uh, <clears throat> complete Q&A session here today. Uh, we sent a uh, email out to registrants, it must have been two or three months ago, just to see what people's comments and um, you know suggestions or, or desires or things were. And uh, one of them was uh, time for a Q&A with Dan. So uh, here we are, the end of, end of July. And I've got a, a few um, questions that have been submitted in the last day or so printed out um, and look forward to engagement, hopefully being fairly active uh, here today. Um, so maybe I'll just do a quick introduction of myself and then, and then jump right into it. Um, so my name is Dan Kittredge. I'm the executive director, uh, founder and executive director of the Bionutrient Food Association. I'm guessing most attendees at this point have a reasonable understanding of who I am. Um, <clears throat> lifelong organic farmer. Uh, and, you know, through my work as a farmer, um, trying to figure out how to make a better living, came upon the principles uh, that I call principles of biological systems. I uh, learned a lot of it uh, when I was actually studying in the Acres community. Um, and also found out there about uh, bricks and, um, you know, nutrient values, nutrient density as a, as a concept, something I had not been previously exposed to or in any meaningful way at least, and um, thought it was a really good idea to focus on nutritional value. And from what I understood of the permaculture community and the organic community and the biodynamic community, the um, agroecology or IPM or conventional ag, it seemed like all those communities were, you know, talking about nutrition, but not necessarily focusing on it as an objective, a specific objective. And so we founded the Biodynamic Food Association in, in 2010 um, as an educational organization focusing specifically on increasing quality in the food supply. Um, and by quality, we're talking about flavor and aroma and nutritive value. And so um, I think that's the niche that we've, we've found. Um, I didn't see any of the organizations really in that space 10 years ago, and I still don't see any other organizations in that space, um, which is interesting um, I, because I think it's important. And I, when I talk to people, I, I, it seems like they also think it's important. So I'm just always a little bit curious about why it is that I don't see a lot of other organizations really actively focusing here. Perhaps it's because we don't have the answers and it's complicated to understand. Um, so. Historically, just for the BFA, uh, just for those who we maybe don't have the perspective, um, <clears throat> we were established in 2010, as I as I said. We have um, our, our initial work was with um, these courses, principles of biological systems. It started out as a six day course, one day every two months, um, and as that spread by word of mouth, further and further afield from our base here in New England, um, it wasn't plausible to be driving or flying to um, Kentucky and Colorado and California every two months. Um, and so we consolidated the course down to a two-day course. And that's you know how it's been run for probably most of the last eight years or so. We also uh, had established early on this uh, soil and nutrition conference. We established it in partnership with NOFA Massachusetts. Um, and this is, you know, as we've been saying, our, our 10th annual uh, conference. So between the courses and the conference um, and presentations at other conferences, that's been the core of our educational work. Um, but we've always been focused on this question of nutrient density and, um, you know, defining it and supporting it. And um, I would say, you know, the concept was that we would, you know, we've been talking about the, the concept of a, of a spectrometer or a handheld bionutrient meter that you can go and, and you know, flash a light at, at food and see what's in it for many years. Um, and as of five years ago, um, it seemed like the possibility to actually create that um, was, was, was coming. When we were first initially looking at it 10 years ago, um, you know, smartphones were still pretty, pretty new and mass produced miniaturized technology of this sort was was not didn't seem like it was plausible but as of five years ago we thought we could start the process and so what we have done um 
is with what was originally called the Real Food Campaign, um, and now we're framing it as the um, BioNutrient Institute. Um, we're um, focusing on three major objectives. One is to build the instrumentation necessary to um, do that testing. The second objective is to identify the variation in food quality so we can calibrate an instrument. And the third piece is to um, understand the connections between management and environmental conditions and those nutrient variations. And so um, as we've discussed most recently, I think with uh, Dan Travis, um, we've been making some quite significant progress on that front of building the instrument, defining the variation, connecting to management, et cetera. So that's really been a lot of our, our work over the past five years, more and more uh, what we're focusing on, I think, um, not emphasizing the courses so much, certainly happy to uh, present them when groups or individuals request them, but really thinking that this definition of nutrient density is, is coming to be a, a critical piece in the broader ecosystem and, and conversation, and uh, one we don't see anybody else focusing on and where we think is really we should be prioritizing. So that's the background of the organization. I said I would talk about myself. I haven't really talked about myself too much. Perhaps that's because most of what I do is this. <laughs> I don't have much of a life beyond beyond all that. Um, <clears throat> but at any rate, um, this this session is set to be a Q&A. And I do have some uh, printed out questions that got submitted. Um, but I would welcome people who have questions to uh, start putting them into the Q&A section um, now so we can have a, an active conversation going forward. So with that said, um, I'll start. OK. This is from Lisa and Dave in Queensland, Australia. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to ask questions. We, we're loving the conference presentations, although time differences mean we watch them later. I had a conversation for John, a question for John Kempf, if you could comment or check with John one day. He mentioned in, in his presentation that he didn't support the need for manure in your system. He was talking about large scale farming, but I just wanted to check whether this was relevant to small scale gardeners too. Thanks for all your wonderful work, inspiration and generosity. Um, thank you, Lisa and Dave, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, depending on what tradition you've been brought up in or, or taught in, um, you know, in some communities, uh, manure is considered to be a, a critical um, fertility amendment um, ingredient. In my perspective, I use the example of earthworms. I say, you know, in, in my soil, when, I, when it seems to me like, like my soil is doing well, if I walk out there at night with a flashlight um, and turn it on, I can see just night crawlers out across the landscape, maybe, you know, one every four inches or three inches or, or six inches. They're just, they're just everywhere and worm casting mounds, et cetera. Um, I, I don't know who gave me the exact number, but it was something like 15 night crawlers per square yard equals um, 40,000 pounds of worm castings per acre per year. So John may not have said that we need manure as in the form of you know cow manure or chicken manure or, or something along those lines, but I think the understanding is that when you do have a well-functioning system, the um, manure in the form of worm castings is likely to be there in significant measure. So um, that's maybe perhaps a, a minor point. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it can certainly be done to excess. Um, you know, putting too much manure or even too much compost on things can cause them to grow in a, in a, in a leggy fashion. Um, you know, too much growth, not enough fruiting sometimes. So uh, the difference between not necessary and not recommended is is significant there. So I would say um, in moderation, whatever that means, <laughs> it's probably fine. Uh, understand that in a well-functioning system, you are going to have a lot of manure in the form of um, worm castings. So, you know, if you've got if you've got that manure, feel free to use it. I don't think you would need to put it down to excessive levels. But I would guess his point was that it's not necessary, not that it's not appropriate. Um, Okay, 
<clears throat> Sharon says, um, unfortunately, we'll not be able to attend the live session. Looking forward to any further comments you have on listening to plants and or the universe and your theory about the effect of proper nutrition on humans' ability to resonate at high enough levels to meet our potential or something in light of the current global predicament. Profound thank for your work and dedication. Um, well, well, uh, <laughs> I'm just reading these in the, in the order they came in, but that's, that's this is a, this is a good one. Uh, for those who have taken the two day course, um, this may be some repetition for you. It is something that I don't often um, go into in great depth otherwise. Uh, for those who have not taken the two day course and are interested, I believe it's freely available on YouTube. Um, so feel free to, to check it out there if you'd like. I oftentimes say that the when people get down to asking me why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, I think that we, um, as humans, you know, we can see ourselves as having a physical body. We uh, understand, you know, that we have senses of touch and taste and smell. Um, but uh, my my perspective is that we have other senses or capacities or um, levels of being as well beyond beyond the physical plane. Um, and when I go into this in some depth in the in the two day course, I, I talk about um, enzyme systems and chemistry. So maybe I'll just I'll touch on that now for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, when we understand that a, um, a spectrometer is something that reads light um, and can tell you what something is, if you look at you know, the way astrophysicists, uh, people who study the stars and the, and the universe, the galaxies, um, are able to look, at, an, look at, a, at, an, at a star and by reading the light that comes off of it, um, they can tell you what's in it. We can say that Alpha Centauri is 51% hydrogen and 48% helium and 2% um, well, 1% other gases that would be uh, and different levels and ratios. It's not by going to that star and sampling it that the astrophysicists get that reading. It's by taking a picture of the vibration of the light that's coming off of it. And we think of atoms or, or, or you know, elements in chemistry as things, we think of copper as a thing or zinc as a thing, but physicists will tell us that zinc vibrates at a certain frequency or that copper vibrates at a certain frequency. And so if you understand that all matter is vibration on some basic level, then we can you know, move forward in this conversation to the point I'm trying to make. Um, we can understand, if you understand that copper vibrates, then maybe you can understand that sugar vibrates, right? Sugar is just a bunch of hydrogens and oxygens and, and carbons connected to each other. If each one of them is vibrating, then maybe the whole compound is vibrating. It's actually, you know, resonating and protein vibrates and hormones are a vibration and enzymes are a vibration. So they may have a certain chemical signature, but they also have a resonant frequency of vibration. Um, and the metaphor I like to use is one of the um, elementary school band concert for anybody who may have had the experience of attending an elementary school band concert. In many cases, the, um, the vibration is not in tune. <laughs> the, it's, uh, you, you know, when that third trumpet or the second flute is out of tune, is sharp or, or flat, um, the whole chord is not harmonic and it sounds dissonant. It, it grates on your, it, it, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a, it's not a sort of a pleasant vibration. Um, whereas if you were to be, uh, <clears throat> you know, attending a beautiful a cappella choir and um, the four voices are singing perfectly in tune, um, you may, you know, when they are singing perfectly in tune, you will hear overtones. You'll hear a note you can hear the note, but no one's singing it because those other notes are so perfectly in tune, a higher octave becomes manifest, it becomes um, realized. And so um, I'll just use those, those two points about 
things that are, you know, things in chemistry are vibrations in physics and, and dissonance and harmony to make my point about nutrition and what is, you know, why I'm focused on nutrient density and the connections between all that and maybe broader cultural benefit. Um, my thought is that um, when you are eating food that does not have in it the full spectrum of nutrients needed for your hormones to be built properly, for your DNA to be built properly, for you know whatever it is, parts of your body to be built properly, because we our bodies are constantly replacing themselves, rebuilding themselves. We get something like four billion new cells every day. You know, the oldest ones are disassembled and and you know removed from the body, and the new ones are built in their place. Um, inside of every cell is DNA. Uh, DNA is a really big, long compound. Um, it requires 25 different elements like copper, zinc, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, cobalt, molybdenum, selenium, vanadium, for every strand of DNA to be replicated properly, four billion times a day. Um, if you're not getting that that full, complete suite of 25 elements in sufficient levels for your basic body to be replicated, um, you can understand that your DNA might not be perfectly replicated. We have genetic markers that we talk about correlating with, you know, disease, cancer, osteoporosis, et cetera, heart disease. Um, when those nutrients aren't in your food and your body is unable to build those compounds, not only, I mean, on some foundational level, your resonant vibration begins to sound more like that elementary school band concert than the acapella choir, I think is the point I'm trying to get to. Um, if we are not in our bodies vibrating harmoniously, um, we're vibrating in a dissonant fashion. And um, I would say that there are all kinds of cultural dynamics at play right now, um, which to some degree have as a common point you know, we as humans not engaging life in a harmonious fashion. Um, I am of the opinion, I think, you know, anybody who studied the wisdom of the East and many traditional cultures as well, um, that we have faculties beyond the physical plane. Um, we have capacities. We talk about the, um, the nadis or the chakras in Sanskrit. We talk about the, um, the um, meridians in Chinese medicine. Um, my opinion is that we all have the ability to tune into some higher, more subtle vibration discernment. Um, Pascal was talking about that last week. Um, and the more harmonious our body is, the more readily we can attune to that and the more we can maintain that attunement. And so the real reason why I'm focusing on nutrient density strategically is because I think it, if we can increase the quality of food for everyone in the world, we can increase quality in the food supply. We can build a dynamic where people are foundationally more coherent and more able to tune into their higher natures. So um, that was a long answer. I hope people followed it, um, but I find it uh, very compelling. Um, it certainly drives me. And let me see, I think I answered Sharon's points here in this question. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, that, I think that covers it mostly. Um, you know, I think she made some comment about the current global predicament. Um, I certainly have been watching over the past, even just, you know, four to six weeks, the um, climatic uh, <laughs> extremes um, I think the IPCC, you know, had came out and said 18 of the 31 metrics that they're following are at extremes right now. We've got massive floods in China and Germany, and I think London got taken out and, you know, uh, Phoenix and, you know, extreme heat in the Pacific Northwest and in Siberia and, you know, um, big typhoons. It, I mean, it, re it really is starting to feel like something um, quite... <laughs> Quite dramatic is happening and it's been predicted for quite some time um and i truly do believe that we have the capacity to reverse it in relatively short order 
Um, they say we as animals are good at this fight or flight mechanism. When something is a long distance away, we're sort of ambivalent or, you know, still not, you know, changing our, changing our ways too much. But I think, I mean, the climate, the climate um, extremes are, I, I think, getting to a point where maybe that fight or flight mechanism will kick in. And um, now that we have the data showing direct connection between soil carbon, soil biological activity, management practices, and nutrient levels in food, um, you know, I think it's very exciting, the opportunity for us to be able to say to people, look, you for your own self-interest and for the health of your children might want to be choosing these carrots over those carrots. And by the way, the more of us to do that, the more balanced our ecosystem will become. Um, I think that's a very compelling uh, argument and a uh, proposition. And, you know, we're just getting to the point with the instruments and the data sets where we can say this in a formal scientific way now, um, just as just as these extremes are coming on. So, yeah, so I guess we'll see how it all transpires, but certainly, uh, <laughs> what's the Chinese uh, curse? May you live in interesting times. <clears throat> all right, Bill asks, a while back, we filled out a survey about the conference, which I think included what I'm about to ask. I'm wondering when we'll be able to have breakout rooms so participants and maybe some speakers can meet and communicate with each other. While the information packed sessions are great, what is missing is that what happens over lunch or in the hallway at the live conferences, thanks. Yeah, certainly a shortcoming of this conference. When we did send that survey out and ask people what they were looking for, actually, Bill, uh, most people said they were not, they didn't think they, they had the time for or desire for breakout sessions. So um, after sending that survey out, we basically decided not to take that on. Um, I do feel like it's, it's a significant shortcoming this year that we don't have that, um, opportunity for people to cross pollinate. Um, so, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> work on that on our next in-person conference. It's very interesting. You know, we have had record record attendance this year from a record number of countries and a record number of States. And, um, you know, in our considerations about the next conference, um, presuming this Delta variant doesn't get too much more severe and we don't have to, we don't have a decision to make because everything's going to shut down again. Um, you know, there's a real cost benefit analysis there with things being in person, but then only certain people being able to attend because of it being in person and the costs of, you know, just registration and um, housing and travel, et cetera. So I'm not sure we've got a great answer for how to be inclusive, to engage everyone globally who wants to attend and still have the benefits of those personal contacts, which are, uh, you know, can't be, can't be replicated, I don't think, except in the physical plane. So um, anybody who's got suggestions or, or sort of, you know, I'd prefer this or I'd prefer that, we're, we're welcome, welcoming um, feedback, but we don't have a, don't have a, don't have a plan to do this, uh, this at this conference. All right, uh, from Letitia, <clears throat> I have two questions for Dan. I heard you say in a course that insects do not attack plants that have all the nutrition they need because those plants form complex carbohydrates and insects can only digest simple carbohydrates. Is there a book I can reference for this specific information? Um, yeah, well, I don't think I said it exactly that way, Letitia, but you basically got the point. Um, um, when I'm teaching the two-day course, I generally tell the story. Um, I say, <clears throat> if you all sitting here in this room when you walked in had seen a bale of hay amongst the chairs, um, you might have considered sitting on that bale of hay, but I'm guessing you likely would not have considered eating it. <clears throat> and people say, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Um, and then I'd say, and if a cow had walked in and she'd seen that bale of hay amongst the chairs, she probably would have considered that a meal. We'll say, yeah, it's okay. So what is it that causes that bale of hay to be food for a cow and not food for a human? Um, and I would say it's the digestive tract of the human versus the cow. The cow has four stomachs. She has the capacity to digest, you know, complex cellulose into a format that can be, you know, made available for her. And we don't. Similarly, 
um, bacteria, fungi, larvae, um, beetles don't have the level of sophistication of digestive tract that we do. And so uh, I believe it's from simple sugars to complete carbohydrates is when the soil-borne pathogens, um, oftentimes bacterial in nature, uh, become unable to digest the plant. Um, when the plant is able to, through a well enough functioning biological system, access the nutrients, you know, build complete carbohydrates out of simple sugars, then it becomes indigestible to those, to those soil-borne pathogens. Um, when the plant is able to build complete um, proteins out of amino acids is when the um, larvae are no longer able to eat the plant, right? So the corn earworm or the tomato hornworm or the Colorado potato beetle, all those larvae um, can only digest amino acids. They cannot digest protein. They don't have the, they don't have a liver. They don't have the enzymes in their guts necessary to digest complete protein. So as your plant is able to go to the level of that biological complexity, um, it becomes indigestible. Similarly, when the plant is able to build a sufficient level of lipids, fats and oils, it becomes resistant to or indigestible to the, um, the mildews and blights, the sort of fungal pathogens. And then finally, when the plant is able to um, build what we call plant secondary metabolites, antioxidants, polyphenols, terpenoids, alkaloids, the things that generally correlate with flavor and aroma um, for us is when the beetles or the adult forms of insects, which have a more sophisticated digestive tract than the larvae or the fungi or the bacteria, that's when they cannot eat the plant. And so, you know, the general story I tell is um, that these, what we call pathogens are nature's report card. And if you've got Colorado potato beetles eating your potato plants, that's nature telling you that you are growing food for larvae. Um, if you've got uh, powdery mildew taking out your summer squash or your zucchini or your cucumbers, you're growing food for fungi. Um, only when the pests that you have in your garden are animals, you know, moles or bulls or rabbits or um, raccoons or deer, only when the animals are your primary pests do you know you're growing animal food. Um, these different you know, I guess technically insects are animals, I believe. So maybe that's not totally correct as I said it, but that, but the point I think is there. We can say mammal food. Um, you know, different organisms have different levels of digestive system function, capacity, and the plant based on its overall health is digestible to those different organisms at different points in time. So um, thank you. Yes, I get all that information from John Kempf. I'm sure he's cited it. It's part of his pyramid, plant health pyramid. Um, I don't, I don't have this. I don't have the specific citations. I'm sorry, but that's the general concept. And uh, your second question from, from Leticia: Why do aluminum levels increase in a soil test when the soil pH gets too low, even without any amendment input whatsoever? Um, <clears throat> well, the um, Aluminum is generally considered to be a symptom of a weathered soil, a worn out soil. Um, uh, the actual soil itself, the, the, the sand or the silt or the clay particle itself, um, I think it's iron, aluminum, oxygen are the, um, and silicon, sorry. Iron, aluminum, oxygen, and silicon are what 96% of the soil is made up of. That's the foundational nature of your soil. And there's a little bit of calcium and potassium and copper and zinc, but those are on the soil colloid um, is where they're assessed. A low pH basically means a lot of those things that were attached to the soil colloid got leached out. And instead of there being a calcium there or, or a um, potassium there, there's a hydrogen there. And all pH is doing is basically telling you the relative numbers of hydrogens to hydroxyls. So, um, when you've got a worn out weathered soil, that means more of your aluminum is available. And as you build organic matter and biological activity, part of what the microbes do is they basically tie up that aluminum. So it's not like it's 
increasing in quantity or decreasing in quantity. It's increasing in availability. And that's what probably the soil test you're looking at is testing. It's not the level of aluminum, but the uh, level of aluminum at this availability range. So the lower the pH, generally the more worn out the soil, generally the more available the aluminum. Um, soils that are in better shape generally have one of the things that the microbes do is tie that up and so it won't show up on a soil test. At least that's my understanding. All right. Okay. Bart has a few questions here. Um, allelopathy refers to the beneficial or harmful effects of one plant on another plant. If we look to maximal nutrient density, what is a good source of information to implement a strategy in your garden vegetable production to maximize nutrient density by combining species that enhance and stimulate rather than harm each other? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, people may have heard about, I think it's black walnut that, you know, basically releases these compounds into the soil around its roots, whereby it becomes, you know, very difficult for any other plant to grow there. Um, some of the brassica family plants may do that, rye may do that. Um, you know, as I understand it, well, I mean, there's a couple different ways to look at this. You can look at it the strictly, you know, evolutionary biology perspective, and then there's also the sort of the consciousness sentience engaging with the with the plant as um, was being discussed last week, way to talk about this. But um, and I don't remember who it was that I heard telling the story about, I think it was black walnuts. And they had basically had a conversation with the black walnuts and said, what's the matter? And they said, you know, we were traumatized some long time ago when we were, we thought there wasn't enough. And so we had to protect ourselves. And this person who was engaging in a, you know, and obviously in a, in a clairvoyant or a, a subtle, you know, communication, which some people may disregard, um, said, well, look, you know, I'm here to take care of you. And there's plenty of nutrition around here. And, you know, it's okay. You, you're, you're safe. You don't need to worry about it. And, and you know, blah, blah, blah. The next year, uh, there was grass growing underneath the black walnut trees. Like they had decided not to ex not to exude those allelopathic compounds to such a great degree. Um, so I think there's some very interesting dynamics here. I mean, we do see that um, that in nature, you know, polycultures seem to be the way things work. I mean, you can find certain examples where there may be one thing in one area, but in general, polycultures are the way nature's you know, system functions and um, different plants have different um, gut floras, different microbial communities that they have symbiotic relationships with, which means they have capacity to solubilize and access different nutrients. And so strategically, it's in the benefit of a corn plant to have access to the nutrients that a tomato plant may be can bring up or an onion plant that a corn plant can't. Um, there's also the question of proximity. And, you know, depending on what type of plant you are, you would rather have more space than oftentimes gardeners will give you. So um, I'm not sure um, a good source of information to implement a strategy to maximize nutrient density by combining species that enhance stimulate rather than harm the other, was the question from Bart. Um, I mean, there are some books about, about companion planting, but um, I'm not sure I can give you a, a direct citation about specifically what that looks like. I don't, I, um, I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of a, of a specific, um, a book or, a, you know, an individual who has put this all together in some meaningful fashion. I think we have the the models of nature to look to um, and exper experimentation as the mode of proceeding forward. Um, when Dan Travis was talking about the, and Greg Ostick as well, the data explorer that we've been building with the, um, the work into nutrient density definition, um, that's part of the framework we've got there is for farmers to effectively document how they grew things. And then um, we can see what the results are on nutrient density. And so by, by having 
a large number of people share what they did and then see what the results are from some empirical standpoint, we should be able to, to be teasing out um, what opportunities there. Um, I'm seeing a couple points here from Ian uh, in the chat. Robert Couric had a good book on companion planting and Faith um, Ernst Gosch's work, Centropic Agriculture, um, neither of which am I familiar with, but I, um, Ian and Faith are both generally good uh, <laughs> good sources of information. So people can look, look to those citations there. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, second question from uh, Bart. How does soil microorganism diversity in, um, link to leaf, uh, link to the plant, leaves, fruits, nutrient density. Um, is the biomicrometer and the outcome of measurement providing you a practical tool with enough ac accuracy to visualize this relationship? Um, so a couple of points there, I guess. Um, the plant diversity links, uh, the, sorry, the microbe diversity in the soil does link directly to the microbe diversity in the plant. Um, we have not had uh, Dr. James White speak yet at this conference. He's, uh, I'm not sure if he's coming up in August or September, but he's gonna be going in some detail into the actual way that these microbes are not just outside the plant, they're inside the plant and, they, and the plant is effectively taking them in digesting part of their bodies, reproducing them, shooting them up the stem, out on the leaf, back out through the roots into the soil. And it's really, I mean, it's not like the plant ends here and the micro begins there. It's, there's a, it's really profoundly interrelated as it is with us animals as well, right? I mean, trillions and trillions of organisms within and without in every organ, um, I think it was, Kiran Krishnan, who was speaking to that, uh, you know, quite profoundly in how that works in immunity in our systems. Um, so, um, um, do we have, have we been looking at the relationship between that microbial diversity and the nutrient density? Um, not yet, not yet. We have not had the resources to do that sort of complete microbial assessment like of all the different species on the soil and in the crop. Um, it's just something that takes um, more resources than we've had, um, you know, something in the order of $150 per sample to do a microbe assay of a crop or of a soil, um, which is would basically be quadrupling the cost that we have right now for a sample, a complete sample set. So. Um, we are very much interested in looking into those connections. We think there's a lot there um, between the microbes, the sp different species and the nutrient levels. But as of yet, we have not had the money to assess it. Um, okay, uh, concept of compost as an inoculum rather than a soil amendment, 100%, um, 100%. I'm not a big fan of compost from a, a practical standpoint. Um, you know, I don't think it's realistic on scale to be adding compost at the level that a lot of small gardeners or backyard gardeners do. Um, there have been some people who were, you know, talking a lot about doing no-till um, and part of their no-till strategy is, you know, um, 10, 20, 30, 50 tons of compost per acre per year. Um, I just look at the planet and I see the you know the different countries and the different environmental conditions and i say you know it is not plausible to be applying that level of compost on production land right that's just if you are in a certain ecosystem if you've got access to your municipal waste stream and you want to put on that kind of levels you know i'm not going to say you shouldn't but from a strategic standpoint if we're looking at regreening this planet um i don't think compost at that level is is um, viable. Now, a good quality compost is an exceptional inoculant. Um, and that's what David Johnson's work out of, I think, formerly New Mexico State and now out of Chico State is proving, I believe, pretty categorically in multiple crops in different climate zones, um, that a good broad spectrum inoculant 
profoundly stimulates the microbial community, which increases plant health, which increases carbon sequestration, which increases pest and disease resistance, which increases farm viability. So, um, you know, we've been advocating inoculants uh, through the BFA for 10 years from now, at least 10 years, at least, at least 10 years now. Um, and I try not to be too dogmatic about which type of inoculant you would want to be using. You can do indigenous microorganisms, you can do uh, worm castings or worm tea, you know, um, uh, compost tea, um, some of the static, you know, compost, the unturned fungally dominant compost. Um, you can use, uh, you can buy inoculants. Um, it is critically important that we do have this full spectrum of um, microbes present in the, in relationship to the plant, if we want that plant to be flourishing. So, um, I try not to be dogmatic about you should just do this kind of inoculation or just do that kind of inoculation. We've got, um, you know, um, Korean natural farming and and Japanese natural farming and now Indian natural farming. Some wonderful stuff happening in India, um, but understanding that critical role of the microbes and ensuring their presence um, and ensuring access to what they need to flourish, I think, is is really essential to um, biological agriculture as I understand it and um, to producing nutrient dense crops. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so this is from Sarah. Uh, what do you tell folks who want to remineralize their growing space who may live on islands or countries that don't import or have certain minerals in stock? or shipping is crazy expensive. Asking because I'm curious for folks living on smaller islands in the Pacific Ocean out here and the, those with less financial resources than myself. I'm on Hawaii Island and can still buy most amendments, but, have, um, but having to think about other sources of phosphorus, for instance, as soft rock phosphate has become very hard to get recently. Um, been talking with other farmers about making bone meals or fish bone amendments um, thank you for all the work in the conference. Um, all right, so that's basically the question. Uh, remineralization when um, logistics are, are limiting. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, it, yeah, these questions are always case dependent. So I would say, uh, as I understand the Hawaiian Islands to be volcanic, um, that volcanic basalt probably has a broad spectrum of elements in it. Um, I'm guessing they dig some of that up and crush it to make roads, and they probably have some waste product from that process that would be called float or um, crusher dust that was likely available at a fairly low price point. So I think, Sarah, um, if you've got a quarry on your island and your island is is um, basaltic or 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 volcanic, you probably don't have an issue. Um, you know, uh, there is this conversation about phosphorus deficiency and people talk about um, not having enough peak phosphorus and things like that. As I understand it, that pertains primarily to people that are focusing on um, soluble phosphorus fertilizer and sort of the chemical mindset. Um, the actual amount of phosphorus that, it, that gets used uh, by a plant in a growing season is fairly small. It, it really gets cycled cycled through, but not really taken out um, in any meaningful way. Um, and, you know, conventional ag has this concept that phosphorus is poorly available. Um, and so you have to put lots of soluble phosphorus onto the soil for plants to have access to it. Um, from the biological perspective, we say, you know, mycorrhizal fungi are extremely good at solubilizing phosphorus. So as long as there's a, a basic level in the soil um, and we have been managing the soil in such a way for the life to flourish, we shouldn't be too worried. Um, if you just don't have enough in your soil and you want to source it, um, that's where remineralization comes in. And uh, I would say you don't need rock, soft rock phosphate. Um, if money is an issue, then that should be always cons considered. Um, maybe if you've got people that are on a an atoll that is, you know, um, made from um, coral 
or something of that sort, then they, we can talk about specific renal deficiencies that are not present on their on their island. Um, and at that point, I'm not sure I could speak to anything from the the remineralization perspective. Um, what I could speak to is the transmutation perspective, where um, you know I think as I've given my courses over time, I've always brought up the the work of um, Louis Kerbrin, a French researcher uh, who documented many cases where um, uh, <laughs> the level of calcium, you know, at the end was different than the level of calcium at the beginning. Um, transmutation, biological transmutation seems to be a thing that occurs in situations where life doesn't have access to the elements it needs, it makes them. It takes atomic weight 12 plus atomic weight 28 to make atomic weight 40. Um, and there's uh, plenty of good experiments you can look at out there. Uh, I don't, you know, I guess I'm, I'm not embarrassed to go off the deep end and say things that I think are, are um, out, of the, out of the norm of what's accepted, um, especially when I think there's some pretty good data to suggest it. Um, but, you know, I've gone back and forth with a lot of the elders from the Acres community, um, Gary Zimmer and Jerry Brunetti and um, um, Arden Anderson definitely worked back and forth with John Kemp on this. Um, I think it was Bruce Tanio that you could buy an inoculant, um, a sodium digesting inoculant. Um, and John proposed this experiment. I think he did it himself. And he took the, I think it was Spect Spectrum Extra was the inoculant. And he said, get two fish tanks, <clears throat> fill them with water, put five pounds of salt in each tank, put this, you know, take the water, send it to a lab, get it assessed add the spectrum extra to one and not to the other, wait two weeks, send the water again and get it assessed. And lo and behold, the one where the microbes that had specific faculties to basically digest sodium and convert it um, had less sodium, more potassium. Um, I think the biodynamic people have done some interesting research with um, chickens, uh, fertilized chicken eggs, where we can see um, if you take 24 fertilized chicken eggs and you um, send 12 of them to the lab, ash them, get a complete mineral spectra, and then for the other 12, incubate them for 20 days until the um, chicks are about to hatch, and then ash those eggs, you'll find much more calcium present in the incubated eggs than you found in the simply fertilized eggs. There's all kinds of bone and feather and things in that egg, along with the eggshell that's still there, that wasn't there initially. Um, so it's not like they're making elements out of thin air. We're finding, you know, the magnesium is going down and the whatever potassium is going down. I'm not sure what the exact details are, but so when it comes to these kinds of deficiencies, you know, and in many tropical zones, you may have high levels of biological activity, but actually very um, low levels of ambient mineral levels because the soils have not been remineralized for millions and millions of years. Um, it does seem that nature has the ability to make elements um, when it needs them. So uh, I'll just put that out there on the edge for people to consider if they're wanting to look more into it. I see the question from Luis, Luis um, Kervran, Luis Kervran, K-E-R-V-R-A-N. And I think the book is Biological Transmutations. Um, so we'll see what people, how people take that response. Um, okay, uh, from Aaron. Um, thank you. Mainly myself and students in my department are embarking in a small market garden, flowers, herbs, and veggies. What and how do you suggest one goes about prepping beds for seed while trying to use minimal tillage practices. It seems impossible to go completely no-till and after trying to reshape a bed the other day with rakes and hoes, I'm on the verge of buying a small tiller for use just in the beds. What do you suggest for market gardeners or farmers trying to go no-till or minimum till? I'm not against tilling if I need to make this go faster and smoother. We do have limited labor at this time. Thank you for everything um, and interested in working with the meter. Okay, yeah, well, um, I think actually, if you look at the data that Dan Travis presented um, a couple of weeks ago, the um, 
the soil carbon levels in a low-tilled environment were higher than the soil carbon levels in a no-till environment. Um, I think the biological activity was better and not remember about the nutrient levels. Um, we had um, um, Rick Haney on talking about the Haney soil test. Um, and one of the takeaways I've gotten from him from looking at, you know, soils as a, you know, what's the overall level of biological vitality and activity in the soil um, is that, you know, in some cases tillage can be beneficial. So I know that there's a lot of talk in the past few years about no till and thou shalt not till and, you know, um, I feel like it's, it's a bit of religiosity and dogma. Um, and as far as I'm concerned as a farmer, you know, practicality has to take uh, precedence. And so um, while there are techniques like um, um, sheet mulching or occultation um, that can be used to kill weeds, um, kill, kill all plants that are present. And so prepare a seed bed um, in that fashion, they do take extended periods of time. And in the case of sheet mul mulching, extended amounts of effort as well. Um, when I bought my farm, it was uh, well worn out. The soils were in pretty rough shape. They were tight. They were um, didn't have a lot of aroma, um, low mineral levels. And um, I understand that you need to have air in your soil for microbes to breathe. And so part of the reason I think why farmers till in the first place beyond trying to kill the weeds is to loosen up, open up the soil so you can get more of that process occurring, um, that you know ability for microbes to breathe process. And so what I did on my farm when I first bought it was to identify mineral deficiencies through taking a soil test. Um, I got all the different rock dusts that I thought I needed. I dumped them on a cement pad and mixed them up actually with the tractor rotor tiller. I just drove the tractor rotor tiller back and forth over the pile of minerals until I thought they were relatively evenly spread. Um, I put, picked them up with a bucket, went out, spread them out in the field, and then tilled. And it took me, I don't know, probably six passes to get down three or four inches. It was extraordinarily tight soil um, and light in color, like I said, no smell. Um, made, my, made my beds, uh, put my drip tape down, planted, mulched. And two months later, the soil had aroma, it was full of earthworms. It was dark in color. It had great structure. Um, and I feel like, you know, I sped the process up of building soil by engaging that tillage process initially to integrate the minerals into it, as well as to open it up so that there would be some air for the microbes to engage with. So, um, yeah, I'm not personally, um, philosophically opposed to tillage. I think there's a, a time and place for all things. Um, certainly we want to err on doing it as little as possible. I generally say I want to see my soil um, less than two weeks of the year. I think keeping soil covered is of critical importance. Um, and I try to disturb the soil as shallowly as possible. So in my mind, you know, coming through with a tractor rototiller at one inch of depth to prepare a seed bed for salad greens is relatively not very destructive. If I've got a good, you know, six, eight, 12 inch deep aerobic zone and bi levels of biological activity, you know, I may be separating the crown from the root of anything plants that are growing there and preparing a seed bed. And so effectively killing the, the whatever weeds or, or plants are that I want to, while still maintaining to a large degree the biological activity in the soil structure. So I do think we can find these, these areas where the nuance is, you know, efficiency and overall maintenance of high levels of biolog biological activity. Um, and I think, you know, as a farmer, if you're not practical, um, you go out of business. So, so we have to, we have to be able to balance these things. Um, all right. <clears throat> Last couple questions here and then we'll jump to the q a and wow i've already used up an hour all right um hi dan would love to hear your perspective on the following leaders in the field uh ooh. 
uh, John Kempf, uh, Nicole Masters, Graham Sait, um, any other, anyone else you would deem worthy that we should be gaining insight from? Uh, this is Dan Lefevre. <clears throat> um, okay, Dan. Well, uh, John, I've known for 12 years. I uh, have deep respect for him. Um, I think he's, you know, absolutely one of the cutting edge um, agronomists and voices in the in the biological ag space. Um, Graham Sait, uh, you know, John basically took a page out of his book. Um, Graham went around probably 30 years ago and just interviewed all of the elders in the biological ag community, wrote a book, Nutrition Rules, I believe, integrated their insights into his product line, um, which as I understand is quite powerful. Uh, I think actually it's, I think it's actually very similar to what John, I mean, John started after Graham, so we have to you know, put that in order of operations, but I think that they're both doing fairly similar work and are quite um, well-spoken, passionate, um, and get great results is my understanding in general. Uh, Nicole, we are having Nicole speak here at this conference this year. I've heard great things about her. I've only talked to her a couple times on the phone, um, but she seems like she's, um, yeah, she seems she seems really good. So um, anyone else you deem worthy, we should be gaining insight from. Well, I think, you know, every year we try to curate this conference in such a fashion as to bring those voices that perhaps are not necessarily um, broadly heard, but have, but have insight. So um, yeah, I mean, anybody I think people should know about, I try to get to speak at this conference. Um, so that would probably be my answer. Maybe it's a cop out, but. <laughs> I don't have time for podcasts. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, uh, I don't stay up on who's who's saying who's saying what. Um, all right. And last question: um, Are there any results from the study comparing hydroponic uh, to soil-grown vegetables and fruits? We did do that last year. I don't know that we got actually that many hydroponic crops. Um, as I recollect, they showed below the average on nutrient levels. Um, but there are certainly people doing a great job in soil and people doing, um, you know, they're, 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 they're um, basically creating dirt through their management. And so it, um, I, I try to stay away from hydroponic bad soil good. Um, I think hydroponics can be done quite well and um, soil can really be abused. So I, I don't I don't think it's ever going to be so black and white. Um, but the averages that we found last year with a relatively small data set, as I recollect, showed um, hydroponic below the average. So, all right, I will now jump to the Q and A. Um, so from Ian Graham, uh, where does Steve Solomon Eric Reinheimer's work in the Intelligent Farmer book fit in with BFA's best practice protocols? Good question. Um, I would say generally very aligned. Um, as I had been teaching this course for some years by that point in time and have subsequently people always said, can you just recommend a book? Can you just give me a book? And I think this one would fit in that category is generally quite good. Um, um, I think if you read closely what Steve uh, writes there, I believe it was him that was doing most of the writing, maybe not. Um, you know, he had written many books previously from a different perspective and he was basically like oh wow i found this stuff out um i don't think he'd integrated all of the um insights about the difference between amending and fertilizing i think that there was still a decent amount of soluble nutrients being recommended in the protocols which i'm personally like to try to get away from certainly i can understand at some points in time there may be appropriate but um you know the concept of that fertilizer is a soluble nutrient, which is sucked up by the plant without the function of the microbe being actively part of it. Um, as I understand it means that we are, when you add fertilizer, you may be giving that plant a boost in that immediate point in time, but you're short circuiting its ability to have that long-term sustainable functional capacity. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it was a minor critique, but I think in general, it's um, one of the better ones out there. 
uh, for people trying to find just a, a one a one off handbook for these principles. Um, another one from Ian. In the climate crisis, economic disruption, disruption world unfolding, we can't bring fertility in from outside our farms. What are you advising for bringing fertility, active biology that is resident on our places to the active plane? Well, Ian, I don't know that I would agree that we can't bring in fertility from outside our farms. Um, and I, I've had this conversation with various people over, to, over the times um, who say, um, you know, we're running out of hydrocarbons. We're not gonna be able to haul to drive trucks anymore. We're not gonna be able to have um, trains that can haul stuff anymore. I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think we are still going to be able to have trucks that haul things and trains that haul things. And <clears throat> I was reading an article this morning about all the, um, the um, charging stations that Tesla has been setting up. Um, so I, I, I do think we should try to minimize what we bring in from outside our farms and it should be as naturally occurring as possible. Um, so in general, my, you know, philosophy is between rock dust and sea salt, you know, you shouldn't really need to be bringing in any other minerals or amendments. Um, certainly uh, seed is valuable until you're saving your own seed. Um, inoculants as well are valuable unless you're, you know, harvesting your own inoculants. Um, what am I advising for bringing um, active biology that is resident on our places to the active plane? Um, generally, in my course, I talk about doing the indigenous microorganism uh, technique, which is basically to uh, take a five-gallon bucket or a bag of, uh, a, you know, a, a shopping bag and go for a walk. And I say, you know, hit as many microclimates as possible. Ideally, you want a, um, a field, a meadow, um, a forest, a, you know, a swamp, um, some field edges. And as you walk through these different ecosystems, you're looking for plants that have shiny leaves. Um, doesn't matter what kind of plant it is. Could be sumac, could be goldenrod, could be moss, could be skunk cabbage, uh, oak tree. Um, you're looking through the ecosystem for plants that have shiny leaves. We understand shiny leaves are a symptom of overall systemic good health. That shine on a leaf is um, is, is the lipid layer, it's a, it's a waxy cuticle, it's called in leaves, but it's basically, it's a fat layer. Um, when we see a cow that's got a sheen on her coat and she's got a, you know, a fat layer on her, um, on her back, we can say she's fat and happy. She's a healthy cow, she's doing well. Um, when you see a cow whose who's coat has a, is dull and you can see her ribs, you, you look and you say something's wrong with that cow. So. Um, in the same way, we want to be walking through our ecosystem, looking for plants that are sh that are shining, that have more vibrancy. And we're going to be reaching down and taking a handful of soil out from underneath each of those plants um, and putting it in your bucket or your bag. So the idea is anywhere you've got a plant in nature that is flourishing, it is not being fed fertilizer, it must then therefore be in healthy relationship with a microbiome. Um, by going out into the ecosystem and harvesting that microbiome, putting it in a bucket, coming back home, you know, you've got a breadth of different species because you got soil from underneath a breadth of different types of plants. Um, then you add water, stir it up and water that out into the field or put it in a foliar spray or put it in an irrigation line. However, however your mode of application is, um, it's not hard to harvest microbes from the ecosystem. Um, and I think it's a really practical thing to do. So um, hope that helps. Okay. Um, from Bill, I have heard that manure at more than a very minimal amount makes the plants lazy by providing soluble nutrients so they do not set up trading with microbes, including fungi. Um, one or two presenters, I think on this conference said this, not sure though. I believe I addressed that on the manure question um, in relation to John Kempf. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to be adding significant amounts of manure. And I do think that while it may cause your plants to grow lushly, it may also um, provide a dynamic where you're seeing more pest pressure because that lushness is not balanced. 
Okay. Greg Reese, um, if the meter can help farmers get a premium for their products, how can we ensure that nutrient dense food is still available to communities of all income levels and respecting social justice? Um, well, <laughs> through being active citizens. Um, yeah, the objective of the meter is to be able to discern the relative nutrient levels of crops. So this beef to that beef, this carrot to that carrot. Um, as we have found in many cases, the variations are, you know, 2x, 5x, 10x, 50x. So um, you could make the argument that if something costs 25% more, but has three times as much nutrition, it's actually less expensive. Um, that being said, you know, we're trying to create a framework where we've got transparency and empiricism. And as a small educational organization, don't presume to be able to control all of the dynamics that occur across the entire planet as far as food security is concerned. Um, you know, I've been watching through COVID as, you know, a lot of food security or insecurity has been, a, has been an issue. Um, and seeing in a lot of areas where and, you know, children are getting something like 80% of their calories through the schools. Um, and simultaneously seeing that um, people from certain socioeconomic backgrounds, um, races, etc., are have higher levels of the um, comorbidities, uh, pre-existing conditions, susceptibility to, uh, you know, death, etc., from COVID. Um, so it seems to me, I mean, I think um, Pierre Riel just had a brilliant presentation here talking about the omega-3, omega-6 ratios and different countries and their death rates and things like that. I mean, I hope people got what he was, was dishing out there. It was hard science and quite compelling. Um, you know, I would suggest that if people are, wanna take the, um, the BIPOC and the BLM conversation forward in this food justice kind of space, let's talk about what kind of food is being supplied by our school systems, right? If we know that this beef is bad for you, basically, and this beef is good for you, and the beef that's being provided by the school system is bad for you, then let's organize around that. Right. Let's organize around the people who are more disadvantaged, whose you know food is being provided by government agencies. Let's like organize around the government agencies providing food of high caliber for those people. Um, so that's just one thing that comes to my mind um, that I think is an opportunity um, for for social movements to be successful. It requires any number of individuals to find their niche and and put their shoulder to the wheel. So, um, you know, we're doing our part to help bring transparency and empiricism to this conversation and hopefully make the direct connections between self-interest from a health perspective and self-interest from a climate perspective. Um, and from a farmer's perspective is self-interest from a fiscal solvency um, perspective. But I don't know that we at the BFA can do everything. I think this is a very important question. And I would suggest, you know, that in many cases, people who are more disadvantaged economically are getting food through some sort of a government um, procurement process. And this would be a great thing to organize around, I think, a great thing to organize around. Okay. Um, another question from Greg. Does time affect the vegetable and soil samples that I sent as a grower partner? I've reached out and coordinated with Victoria Cox to send samples to both Chico and Michigan to see if there's a difference. Would you encourage others to do the same? My farm is in San Diego County, Southern California, thanks. Um, time does matter, certainly, um, on the compounds. So for antioxidants and polyphenols, um, they do break down over time. Uh, for calcium and copper and zinc, they do not. So whatever was in the crop when it was harvested will still be in the crop two weeks later or two months later. 
if it's still around. Um, yeah, I think it's an important conversation. Um, some of our um, allies, there's a group called uh, Teak Origin that has been doing some research looking at food in grocery stores. Um, and what they found was in many cases, the nutrient levels in the food at Whole, Whole Foods was lower than the nutrient levels in the food at Walmart. Um, and it's not because they came from different farms per se, but it was simply because the Walmart supply chain moved faster. And so it was only five days between harvest and being on the shelf for Walmart. And it was more like nine days between harvest and being on the shelf at Whole Foods. So time does matter in the compound degradation. Uh, it does not matter in the mineral um, levels. Matt asks, um, in a world that continues to evolve, where do you think a deeper understanding of nutrient density and nutrition can take us? Ooh, that's open-ended. Um, well, I think I touched on the point about, um, you know, consciousness being grounded through coherence in our physical forms. Um, maybe I didn't say it quite that way, but, you know, my personal opinion is that we do have um, higher aspects of our beings um, and that, you know, the, the dance is how well that's being grounded. And I think the more, the more coherent our physical forms are, uh, the more well we are able to tune into ground manifest our, our higher natures. So, um, I don't think food is the be all and end all. I don't think it's the only thing out there in the world, but I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle. And a lot of what people have access to right now and have had access to for the past couple of generations is subpar. And I personally think that's a com major component in the relative dissonance in the culture. Um, I also think, you know, social media, uh, you know, mass media, education, um, economic structure, there's all kinds of ways we take in energy, take in ideas, you know, um, set our minds about what's true and what's possible. I think all those are also factors. So if you want to call those food, fine, then we can say everything, you know, food really matters across the board. Um, but um, yeah, I think that maybe at least offers some comment for you, Matt. Um, Emmanuel says, uh, soil microbiome is extremely complex and so is the gut microbiome. How do you see the connection between both? Um, not being a, a microbiologist, I can speak in, in broad terms. Um, I understand that the microbes evolved us, whether us is plants or us is animals. I understand that they came first and they are, there are more of them in our bodies, more of their cells in our bodies than there are our cells that they are absolutely in charge of our systems. Um, and that when they are flourishing, then we are flourishing. And when they are struggling, then we are struggling. So um, it is very complex. I don't know that it's worthwhile trying to understand everything in proved out, you know, nuance and, and point. Um, really, I try to look at the pattern and say, you know, what's the, what's the thing that I can intuit here and how can I have a practical effect? Um, so in general, engaging in a way so that your microbiome is happy and healthy and flourishing um, will probably have positive impacts for you. And engaging in a way that is destructive to that community will probably have negative impacts for you. So I think, um, I don't think it's, in my mind, much more complicated than that. Um, but that's roughly what I see. I'm a little bit sensitive to time, so not taking as much time on some of these questions as I was on the earlier ones, um, trying to get through. Okay. Um, okay, Bill looks like has two questions about uh, calcium. Um, when you were in Raleigh a couple of years ago, you talked about calcium to break up our heavy clay weathered soil. 
I'm still using oyster shell. I cannot find any other good source of calcium at a lower cost. The shipping cost makes everything else more costly. Do you have a solution? Um, his cost for gypsum is higher than oyster shell. Wow. Um, well, I don't know your scale bill. Um, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I mean, you're not looking at calcitic lime. Generally, that is remarkably inexpensive and oftentimes recommended by um, the agricultural extension agencies of the local universities. So um, yeah, if you've got a, a, a base saturation of calcium that's below, you know, 65%, 68%, 70%, if you've got clay soil, um, generally calcium carbonate, calcitic lime is the least expensive source to um, address that deficiency. So I'm not sure why you don't have that listed here, but I can't imagine that's a limiting factor where you are or unavailable. Um, but again, I don't know your scale. Um, other sources of calcium, um, I mean, I personally love carbonatite. Uh, it's a material out of um, Ontario. It's got a remarkable geological story behind it. Um, it is, I think, 20% calcium by, um, by assessment. It also has a bunch of other things. I think it's 10% trace elements, remarkable suite of trace elements in it. Um, it's got some rock phosphate, it's got some green sand. Um, and the remarkable thing about it is that all those minerals have been effectively digested by microbes ahead of time, so they're very bioavailable. Um, and I certainly have on my fields um, that were sort of old worn out hay fields that had a, you know, a goldenrod and brambles um, in the fall spread the carbonatite and um, it was clover in the spring. Literally the goldenrod was no longer there. The brambles were no longer there. It came back to lush clover and it was just stupefying. So um, uh, John, as I said, I said aragonite, absolutely a great form as well. I think generally more expensive as well. Um, so cost benefit analysis, um, aragonite is a, is a very good source. Uh, Ian says, um, fermented plant extracts are also possible. You're not going to get significant quantities to fermented plant extracts. Uh, there's some good things people can do with, you know, taking your bones, if you eat beef or chicken and, and setting them in, in vinegar and you can pull calcium out of them. Uh, um, but if you're talking thousands of pounds of calcium, um, on some number of acres, I, um, you know, I, I would say I, I, limestone is generally, you know, calcium carbonate is generally your generally your source of least expense. Um, and this comment here was about calcium sulfate, which is gypsum. I think, yeah, we'll let, let that be. Okay, um, Nicholas asks, any thoughts regarding the large monopolies controlling much of our money, food, and freedom? Uh, okay. <laughs> Fed, Bill Gates, pharmaceutical companies, etc. It seems they're gaining more power by the day. Do you, Dan, have suggestions for small organic farmers in today's world to thrive and stay in business as more regulations continue to support large-scale farms growing monocrops of soy for the production of imitation meat and such? Sorry for the vague question. I don't think that's vague. That sounds like a straight up <laughs> uh, soapbox. Mm. Um, do I have any suggestions for small organic farmers in today's world? Um, I think, you know, part, part of why we focused on this nutrient density concept is that not all food is created equal. And um, while, while the USDA may put on the label for a carrot that effectively all carrots are equal, you know, that's not the case. And so our thought is if we can support consumers in understanding that the crops from the local organic farm may be superior and by some significant measure to what's available at uh, Whole Foods or Walmart, um, then at least we can 
you know, put a finger on the lever to say there was some major difference here besides local and not local. Um, and that's not saying that just because it's a local organic farm means their crops are better, right? In some cases, we've shown pretty clearly that's not the case. Um, I do feel like there's some very large, you know, how do you say them, monopolies controlling um, significant dynamics in our culture. It does seem to be getting pretty pronounced. Um, you know, in my mind, the more we are in healthy relationship with nature, with life, whether that's the environment around us or our family or our community or our internal relationship, um, the more we are part of the solution and not the problem. And I was just talking to some friends a couple of days ago about the fact that I don't buy anything online. I don't have a credit score. I, you know, because I don't buy anything with a credit card, I don't, you know, um, download apps. I don't have a TV. I don't, you know, there are certain things to social media. I like where you put your attention and energy to my mind is where you are creating, co-creating as it were. And so um, I think it's incumbent on all of us to do the best we can with our own lives um, and, you know, let the, in my mind, at least where I'm at, in my understanding, the relationship with nature as it's most deeply understood, be our guide. Um, and um, there's a, it's so easy to talk about other people and, you know, most people think that, or Americans are this way, or the bankers are that way, or whatever. It's really easy to sort of have this sort of superiority complex where you think that you're better and they're bad. Um, and I don't think it's beneficial to engage in that thought form, particularly. I think it's beneficial to create as harmonious of an environment around you as you possibly can. Um, to uh, speak well of the people you engage with, to um, to focus on solutions, to be a you know to be the you know be be what you want to see. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, Nicholas. But um, there, you got a little bit more knowledge about me than you had before. Um, Martha, uh, did you include a question in your survey about some kind of online discussion group as a communication alternative to breakout group? I don't know that we did, Martha. I don't know that we did. Um, I guess that would be something like a listserv. Um, it should not be hard to set up. And um, I'm not sure if other people want to, you know, post up, up votes or down votes in the, in the chat or something. But I, I think if that's a, a desire. Um, I think part of the problem was that people have schedules where it's hard to say at this hour, people from six continents and 45 states would like to all engage directly. So I think actually that makes a lot of sense, a webinar, uh, sorry, a listserv kind of a, a, a structure. Maybe we can put that out um, in a subsequent email. Uh, Ellen asks about the meter update. Um, yeah, so we were supposed to ship out these next generation meters in June. Um, you know, the first meters we built in 2017, we released them in their raw form, I think in 2018, the first generation. Um, and now that we've got enough data to calibrate them, um, we are shipping out sort of a next generation. It's got a tear button, so it's not much different than the first one, except for the fact that it has a tear button and we have enough data so that when you flash a light, you don't just get a peaks and valleys on a graph, which means nothing, you get a number. Like this is in the 80th, 84th percentile of polyphenols mm -hmm. and the 60th percentile of bricks, uh, et cetera. So we have those calibrations for 10 crops. Um, and we're planning on having them shipped, um, well, shipping next week and being in people's uh, mailboxes by the middle of August. Um, we've spent, I've spent, we've spent um, 
Next seven has been actively involved in this. Um, you know, our side has been the partner in doing all the lab work and the engineering, um, but we haven't spent much time at all on the on the user experience, the user interface. So, what does it look like? How do you engage the thing? And um, as we were reviewing it in the end of May, in preparation for shipping everything out in the beginning of June, as we had said we would do, we had all the meters built, and I couldn't make heads or tails about how to make it work. And I'm like, Greg, we gotta. <laughs> We got to make this work better. So uh, it's been taking a lot of time, um, and it's pretty good. Um, it's a lot better, at least. It's 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 much much better. The user user interface, user experience. So um, yeah, anybody who's ordered one um, and this second generation that's been waiting for the meter uh, should have gotten an email uh, a couple of months ago, a couple weeks sorry, a couple weeks ago, telling them that it was going to be shipped in the beginning of August and. Um, yeah, we're very excited. You know, we've actually have done this thing of building a handheld spectrometer at a consumer price point that can give you readings on nutrient levels in food, you know, with a flash of light. So um, it's not the end game. It's not the nutrient density assessment. It is the, you know, antioxidant level, um, polyphenol level, uh, bricks level, and BQI. So um, nutrient density is different than each of these compounds. And I think that's a really important point. Hopefully uh, we'll continue to make it. Um, so this is this is not the iPhone, this is the Apple II, but it's, it's um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of work going on behind the scenes to put it all together. Uh, okay, we've got, ooh, almost out of time. Um, Is a hybrid conference possible using Zoom in the speaker rooms? Um, it is possible. We discussed that earlier. I don't remember why we decided not to do it. Um, but I suppose it is possible going forward as well. So I, it looks like there's some good suggestions here in the chat. I hope, Chris, you can save them all and we can um, pass them on to Liz for discussion about the next, next uh, conference. Um, any, are we doing any work? Um, with partnering to supply nutrient dense foods to hospital patients, um, we are not doing that directly yet. We still don't have a definition for nutrient density. Um, I think we had uh, Catherine Couch on earlier in the present, earlier in the conference, and she's the one I know of who's doing the best work in that area. Greg, to your question. Um, all right, how are we doing here? Um, does the meter need a smartphone or does it work independently? It needs not only a smartphone, it needs an Android smartphone. So if you do not have an Android, but you have an iPhone, you must order one from us or get one of your own. It looks like we'll be shipping out actually small tablets, seven inch tablets. Um, they're easier than the smartphone um, to set up, et cetera. So, uh, for an extra, I believe it's $40. Um, the meter is $377. The, the smartphone or tablet is $40. Um, yeah, the readout happens independently through Bluetooth. It does not happen on the, on the meter itself. All right. Um, and I think there was one good question here that Chris posted just at the beginning on the chat. So let me see if I can find it. Well, looks like that was from uh, Greg and it did get posted. So, all right. Um, looks like we've gotten most of the questions answered. I was afraid this would be a, I'd be a, I'd be stalling for time, but I feel like I've had a chance to, uh, <laughs> had, had to rush to get through them all. So I um, hope everybody enjoyed the, enjoyed the monologue. And um, yeah, I do want to improve the, the interactivity over time. Um, certainly this electronic format has been great for providing accessibility, um, but it has not been good for community. Um, but 
we'll continue to work moving forward. And thank you all for your support and your attention and intention. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's the it's the I think I think this is the time I feel like I've been waiting for, um, where it's all so turbulent. Um, it may appear to be difficult, um, but I think those are the times when change is possible. And so feeling as an organization like we're, you know, really hitting our stride with our work and with what we're bringing forth, um, you know, being very plausibly, uh, you know, available to the masses in the near future and as a support to transition, um, you know, I think it's, uh, <laughs> they're interesting times, they're interesting times, but um, from this side, you know, while it certainly is a lot of work to keep moving the ball forward, um, it's a, uh, it really feels plausible that we're gonna pull this thing off and have some significant effect. So uh, for that, I'm very grateful. All right, well, thank you everyone. And and I hope you're uh, doing well in your own lives and feeling inspired and and part of solutions. So thank you very much. <laughs>